Okay, I am a washerwoman, and um, I do laundry for the community. Um, and one of the things about being a washerwoman is that it was one of the few professions that a woman with children could do. Um, so if you were widowed or your husband uh, was not a good provider, you could take in uh, washing and laundry. And communities of any size almost always had uh, some woman that was willing to do laundry for other women because laundry was considered the dreaded chore. And while obviously most women or many women did the laundry for their families, uh, hiring somebody to do the laundry uh, was uh, very uh, important and essential and people made, uh, did barter for that and, and actually also paid people. Well, um, my husband passed away and so um, I had to uh, feed my children and uh, I had equipment to take care of my children. My children can help me uh, in doing laundry and so that's how I became um, a, a laundress. The, it, it's really backbreaking work. Um, bending over and, um, and, and scrubbing on the rub board um, is uh, difficult and uh, your, your hands are in hot water you're, uh, constantly and your hands are in contact with lye soap constantly. Um, I have a document where a blacksmith comments that his hands are not as hard as the laundry woman's hand in the community. So I think that gives you some sense of how difficult this work was. That it's something that um, I can in involve my children um, and grandchildren um, with. And uh, I'm outside uh, a lot, uh, which has obviously advantages and disadvantages depending on the weather and the time of year. I have been a washerwoman now for about 20 years. Really, Laundry practices, um, the, the laundry practices that we think of as belonging to um, the olden days are still the laundry practices of uh, the contemporary world that doesn't have access to electricity. So the, the, the rub board, for example, uh, and, and I have here the first kind of rub board, which is a paddle, which dates back to the Vikings. Um, and uh, the paddle was used, actually the paddle was used by Egyptians to um, pound uh, linen cloth. And then the Vikings or somebody uh, similar to the Vikings um, ridged one side of it. Uh, so that goes back, um, obviously millennia um, doing that. The, the rub board probably came into existence um, around the 1500s, uh, 1400s. Uh, bluing, which makes clothes look whiter, uh, dates to the 15th century um, as well. And so, but once, once we got to the rub board, the wash tub, um, and the ringer, which came into existence in the, 18, uh, in the 1840s, um, it hasn't really changed all that much until electricity and the invention of the washing machine. Yeah, I had true. to I had to work up and and purchase and purchase it and um, in the 1860s it cost about um, nine dollars which would have been a 
considerable sum of money. But if you think about how much a washing machine costs, it costs relative to people's um, income about as much as a washing machine um, costs today. Since a lot of the income that I receive is actually barter, so I'll go and do, um, or, or, or I'll do laundry and I'll get, um, say, a chicken or a ham or some bacon or flour um, or coffee. Um, I'm able, with that additional income and what I raise in my garden, I'm able to, um, um, I'm able to feed, uh, uh, feed my family and uh, the land and the house that we had before my husband passed away is what we're still living in. I could say the first step is building a fire and getting hot water uh, because that would obviously be uh, an important part. As a professional washerwoman, the fire under my kettle, under my wash pot, would never go out. But for a woman doing laundry for her family, she might restart the fire um, however she um, however she did it. As a professional laundress, uh, there were two things that, that professional laundresses tended to do. Either the family would bring the clothes to the laundress uh, tied up, usually tied up in uh, brown paper or they might bring a basket um, of dirty clothes to the laundress uh, for uh, the laundress to sort and wash. Or, in some occasions, if the laundress happened to have access to um, a, a wheelbarrow or a cart, um, she would actually take her equipment to the family's home and set up in their yard and do, um, and do the laundry. Um, actually, anybody that had something they could barter, um, like I said, women um, by and large hated to do laundry, so if they had something they could barter, um, they would do it. Well, I've already uh, showed you the, um, the rub board, the wooden wash tub, and most women had wooden wash tubs and they kept water in them all the time. Certainly a professional laundress would have water in it all the time to keep it sealed tight. Um, wooden wash tubs were ubiquitous from as far back as we have any data um, up until the widespread use of galvanized uh, galvanized metal in um, in the uh, late 1860s, early 1870s, and then women all over the world <laughs> threw away their wooden wash tubs because they're heavy uh, and replaced them with galvanized metal uh, wash tubs. One item that was specific to Civil War laundresses, they weren't even used in the fort uh, so much was the tin wash tub. Uh, tin, as you can tell from this example, it rusts, and so it wasn't practical uh, for a professional laundress um, or a, a housewife laundress um, to use them, but there's so much lighter weight than the wooden ones that, that's what the Union Army issued to their laundresses. Our variations of washing dollies, and of course some people just use this stick. But a professional laundress would have had something like this because it moves the water so much better. It's an, uh, I've also heard this called an agitator, just like in a modern, uh, mm -hmm. modern washing machine um, here. Um, and they were used primarily in the wash pot itself. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned briefly that, the, that a, um, a ringer was invented in the uh, 1840s and became uh, really ubiquitous. If your husband was a good provider, he made sure that you had them uh, certainly by the 1860s. Um, 
if you were a housewife laundress and a professional laundress would have saved up to get it because it's it's really the greatest labor saving device obviously bringing clothes out bringing clothes out is really hard on your hands uh, women had carpal tunnel syndrome before we knew what that some of the items uh, liquid soap is what was used most of the time women would make soap uh, they would make the lye they were capable of making the lye um, by dripping water through hardwood ash and mixing it with some kind of, of oil. And then when Red Devil Light Soap uh, became available, I think in the late 1880s, most women started using that. And Red Devil Light Soap makes hard soap, whereas lye dropped through wood ash makes a soft soap. You could make it into bars if you added salt but nobody's going to waste salt on, um, um, on that. Another thing uh, that would be used, I, I think I mentioned this briefly, a bluing bag. And up until Mrs. Stewart invented a liquid bluing, once again, you can buy Mrs. Stewart, but uh, you had bluing balls. It was a, it was a, a hard thing. I mean, it dissolved in water, but it was uh, sold little uh, balls like that. And as I mentioned before, I think uh, that dates from the uh, 15th century. Um, I have an iron here. Women uh, tended to own lots and lots of irons. If you go to antique stores today, you'll often see um, irons like this. They're called sad irons, not because ironing was a sad chore, although it was a sad and hot, uh, it was a difficult chore, um, but because of just a block of iron was, was often called sad. Okay. Um, they were often made by blacksmiths, so they were often quite unique. Borax was often added um, to the wash water uh, to help get grease and stains out. Uh, Borax was available for sale very early in um, the 19th century and possibly even before. Salt was often used as a stain remover. Vinegar and ammonia were also used. Vinegar would cut soap scum. Um, and um, ammonia is very good at removing stains, particularly blood stains. And Particularly in hospitals, um, ammonia was used a lot uh, and was even uh, produced in the hospital, in many hospitals, particularly military hospitals. It was the laundress's job to empty the bedpans, not the nurse's job to empty the bedpans. Uh, she would collect and strain the urine and sit it out to concentrate uh, to make ammonia and then bring it in and use it to clean the bloody, um, the, the bloody clothes. Another item that a professional laundress would have had access to, and possibly a home laundress, or a woman who was a servant in the home and, and, and laundry was her primary responsibility, I hope I can get this open, was fuller's earth. Fuller's earth was used on wool clothing, and sometimes it was used on silk clothing, although, uh, Alcohol and spirits were often used on silk clothing as, as well. So, um, for the for a nice silk dress, a woman might uh, sponge it off with vodka, for example, um, or bourbon if that's what she had access to. Moonshine. Anyway, um, here's some Fuller's Earth. You can see it's a very fine powder, and you would just uh, rub it on things and then brush it out with a clothes brush. So, and one of the most important items was starch. Um, everything was starch um, and iron uh, that that was ironable. I mean, like wool is mm -hmm. not really ironable, but um, but everything was starched and ironed. On ironing day, um, put on a big pot of potatoes or rice um, or corn 
and scoop off the starch that would rise to the top and use it to starch her clothing. And then at the end of the day, she'd have food to feed her family so she didn't have to make an additional, um, an additional meal. Um, well, let me talk, let me talk about uh, what I'm wearing here. This is called a chatelaine. And um, a, a lot of women wore chatelaines. And I, would, I think that a professional laundress might have had a chatelaine. It's a way to keep my sewing um, equipment um, close by. So I have my thimble here. Um, I have some thread and needles um, here on a thread winder. Um, I have my sewing scissors um, here because part of the job of doing laundry was mending as well. Everything that I'm wearing is washable. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing a bonnet and I'm relatively certain that a woman outside in the sun would have been uh, wearing a bonnet, uh, an apron to protect my dress um, there. Uh, I'm wearing a Penner apron because that's characteristic of the 1860s, but at other time periods, other styles of aprons. Um, I do have a, a rope petticoat on because once again in the 1860s, having your skirt stand out from you was important. But once again, I'm around fire a lot, so I don't want to do that. Um, those are just some things about uh, the role of the washerwoman.